her husband, but if she couldn't be with him, she wanted nobody. She couldn't stand the restrictions of court. She hated crowds and public display. She wasn't the least interested in politics. And she hated her mother-in-law. In those early days, Elizabeth spent much of her time in the small palace of Laxenburg, just outside Vienna, on the road to Hungary. It should have been a paradise for her. But because her mother-in-law was also there, because Franz Joseph was off early each day to his office at the Hofburg, it became her prison. In that prison, she sulked. Had she been less of a child, she'd have known better how to share her husband's problems and strengthen him in his brittle self-sufficiency. Instead, she took to riding. It became an obsession. But Franz Joseph was partly to blame. Unimaginative by nature, he loved but did not understand. Unknown to Elizabeth, he was overwhelmed by what he himself described as the horrible perplexities of the moment. Having isolated himself from his subjects in order to assert his domestic policy, he was now about to isolate Austria from the rest of Europe in order to assert his international authority. But it was a Europe with quite a new pattern emerging. England, with her great colonial empire, was on the defensive. France was set on the recovery of her former glory. Prussia was on the make. Italian nationalism was moving towards a climax. Above all, Russia was emerging as a dynamic and expanding power. Her interest lay in the Balkans, where a gradual Turkish decline was creating a dangerous new power vacuum. Russia convinced herself that she was conducting a crusade. England and France felt their position in the Mediterranean threatened. The result was the Crimean War. Franz Joseph, fearing above all the breakdown of the delicate balance of power, stayed neutral. In the end, he was hated by everyone. And once the cannons were silent, he was face to face with a problem he couldn't avoid. Cavour, the brilliant prime minister of Sardinia, was determined to unify a fragmented Italy. He found a powerful ally in France, now personified by the emperor adventurer Napoleon III. Together, they could hope to drive Austria out of her rich Italian provinces, Lombardy and Venetia. It wasn't difficult for Cavour, with his genius for intrigue, to manipulate Franz Joseph into war. War with Austria as the technical aggressor. Arriving at the quadrilateral to take command, Franz Joseph was appalled by his army's initial defeat at the hands of the French and Italian forces. He stood on the eve of his first great battle. As commander-in-chief, he overruled his frightened generals and turned his army round to fight. Now came the supreme test of his faith in military solutions. But instead of getting a good night's sleep before the Battle of Solferino, he sat up late writing to Elizabeth. From Laxenberg, she'd been bombarding him with letters, begging to be allowed to join him in Lombardy. My dear, dear, my only angel, alas, I cannot grant your desire, though it would please me so much if I could. Women simply do not fit into the life of a military headquarters. 
I can't set a bad example.